Opens March 8th at National Heart. Good morning, America. This morning, the deadly nor'easter, the killer storm hammering the northeast coast. Homes slammed by a wall of water. Look at this surge. Emergency evacuations overnight and by all means possible. Millions without power, with neighborhoods underwater and more flooding threats this morning. Treacherous travel, a roof ripped right off this airport. Hurricane force wind gusts making for some terrifying flights. Thousands of cancellations. Train travel derailed too from D.C. to Boston. Trucks flipped with snow piling up. We've got the latest on the travel headaches. White House turmoil, President Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, coming under new scrutiny over potential conflicts of interest. Are his days by Trump's side numbered? And Oscars by the numbers. We are behind the scenes as Hollywood gets ready for its biggest night of the year. What the stars will be drinking. And we'll be pouring around 12,000 flutes for the guests. And eating. Tasty. Okay. Including ruby colored chocolate. Live from ABC News in New York, this is Good Morning America. Hey, good morning, everybody. Paula is off preparing for our Oscar coverage tomorrow. Uh, she's going to hopefully explain what Ruby Covered Chocolate is all about. We are very lucky, however, to have ace White House correspondent Cecilia Vega wow. with us on the set. The introduction. Yeah. Thank yes. you. And that's not even saying as, as strongly as I feel it. As, uh, as I wrote into the prompter for right. you to she say it. She tells me what to say, but it's, it's even that. Verging on sarcasm. Yeah. Exactly. Whoa, Thank no, you. No, no. Claiborne. Means it. He's a man who knows something about sarcasm. That's true. Uh, we're going to start with lots of nonsense coming up, but we do want to start with some news. We have that fierce and deadly storm that's moving through the northeast. Yeah, it really is, and moving fast. Millions of people across the northeast are waking up without power this morning. Take a look at this video out of Wenham, Massachusetts. That is a downed electrical wire likely set this gas main on fire there. Some pretty big flames. And this is Duxbury, Massachusetts, where an entire neighborhood is underwater. You can see it's almost at the top of that white picket fence at the left top of your screen there. And with this storm has come some dangerous rescues. This is a mother and child picked up by fire fighters after their house was flooded. The Nor'easter are also creating massive travel delays as well. This is a picture of the large frustrated crowds at New York's Penn Station. We have team coverage right here this morning. First though, let's get it over to Sam Champion who's tracking the storm. Sam, good morning to you. Hey, good morning, sir. Good morning, everyone. And what we need to know about this storm is that the wind problems, the flooding problems, that's the travel delays, the power outages, that all continues today. Here's a list of the worst of the worst so far. If you have anything worse than this, just send it to me on Twitter and we'll put it up there. But Barnstable, Massachusetts, peak wind gust. 93 miles an hour. What you will hear today is people tell you that's a Category 1 wind gust. When they say that to you, you say this to them. Category 2 is 96. That's how close it was to a Cat 2 hurricane. Crazy. Boston, look at those winds, 70 miles per hour. The biggest rainfall total, almost 6 inches, and the snow, almost 40 inches. Here's where the storm is now. Watch that rain still pulling off the shoreline today, but the winds go all the way down from Maine into Virginia. There's where the low is. We still have a lot of wind warnings out right now. High winds at about 36 miles per hour, uh, down to 22, 27 in the New York City area and uh, that Boston Barnstable area. It has been a rough, rough 24, 48 hours. Gio Benitez has been there the entire time. He is in Boston right now. Gio, not only that were you in Boston right now, but you were in uh, 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 Situate yesterday and where you saw those waves that were bigger than the houses they were washing over. That had to be crazy. It was just unbelievable, Sam. You and I have covered a lot of these hurricanes, and we've seen things like that. This was just incredible. And you know, Sam, here in Boston, we are still feeling some of those wind gusts that you're talking about. You know, here at the Boston Harbor, they saw the third highest water level on record. We're talking about a storm surge of nearly four feet, and the flooding threat is not over just yet. Overnight, the monster nor'easter blasting homes with wind and waves, waves reaching as high as second-story homes. In Quincy, Massachusetts, children rescued by the National Guard after their neighborhood flooded. Rescues taking place in the buckets of tractors with the water washing out roads. This couple and their dog brought to safety on a boat. This man stranded in his vehicle trying to get out. Look at this surge. The wind gusts reaching up to 93 miles per hour. Tough for us to even stand it. And this incredible wind that you're seeing right now, this is actually coming off the ocean. Power outages across the Northeast with more than 2 million customers without electricity this morning. In Pennsylvania, the downed power lines causing fires. 
and the storm turning deadly with at least seven deaths, all from falling trees, highlighting the unexpected danger of some of nature's heaviest debris. Stay out of it if you can, uh, avoid being outside. A lot of these tree limbs are coming down and people aren't prepared for them. On the road in James City County, Virginia, a truck driver could not avoid a falling oak tree. The passenger was killed. And back here live at the Boston Harbor, we can tell you that the wind and the water are still a concern because the next high tide is at around midday, and that could mean even more coastal flooding. Dan, Cecilia? It is going to be a rough weekend. Okay, Gio, Over. thank you. That storm is creating a travel nightmare along the East Coast. I was stuck in that trying to get here <laughs> this it's weekend. It's unpleasant. Yeah. Planes grounded, trains, buses, and cars at a standstill. ABC's Kenneth Moten is at Reagan National Airport covering the travel angle. Kenneth, what's happening? Dan and Cecilia, this morning, airports and train stations will try to bounce back from this winter storm. The strong wind, still a problem, especially here at this D.C. airport. I can tell you that already we're seeing flight delays and hundreds of cancellations. Overnight, the powerful nor'easter left its mark behind, ripping this roof off at LaGuardia Airport in New York. In D.C., a 737 attempted to land on a runway, fighting those 40 to 60 mile per hour wind gusts. The pilot told to abort. Affected by the stormy weather, more than 3,400 flights were canceled in the Northeast. And the roadways, a mess. Brutal winds knocked over a semi in Rhode Island. Another overturned on this bridge in New York. Flipped over. Whoa, Varizana Bridge. This truck flipped just outside of Baltimore. Further inland, heavy snow from New York down to Pennsylvania. Nearly 40 inches falling outside of Albany. In the Pocono Mountains, conditions so bad, Interstate 380 shut down, trapping drivers in their cars for hours. It's been horrible. I was stuck on the side of the road since 9.30. Um, around 2 o'clock, somebody finally was able to pull over and pull me out my ditch. Travel on the rails, even worse. Amtrak forced to cancel service along the Northeast Corridor. In Boston, water poured into the subway station. And in New Jersey, these commuter rail tracks flooded. Amtrak says it will be back up and running this morning along most of the East Coast. That D.C. to New York route still impacted, operating on a modified schedule. Dan and Cecilia. A nightmare. Kenneth, thank you. We are going to move on now to politics and a whole new level of turmoil at a White House that, as Cecilia can attest, is all too used to turmoil. Exactly. And now there are new questions this morning about potential conflicts of interest for the president's son-in-law and senior advisor, Jared Kushner. The president is not happy with him, but it is not just Jared Kushner. The list of possible West Wing departures is growing. ABC's David Wright is at the White House with more. David, good morning. Good morning, Cecilia and Dan. This has been another topsy-turvy week here at the White House with the president abruptly changing course on issues from gun control to a possible trade war. And this morning, new headlines raise questions about one of his closest aides. Publicly, the president has full confidence in his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. But privately, White House sources say Kushner's potential conflicts of interest with his family business are a source of concern. This week, the New York Times reported that two Wall Street firms loaned Kushner's family business more than half a billion dollars after executives had multiple meetings at the White House with Kushner. Six weeks later, the SEC dropped an investigation into one of those firms, Apollo Global Management. The timing raises questions, although both sides deny there was a quid pro quo. Another new report in The Intercept alleges Kushner's family real estate firm sought a huge investment from the Emir of Qatar last April to shore up financing on this Fifth Avenue high-rise. Qatar declined. Weeks later, the White House gave tacit approval to an economic blockade of Qatar by its neighbors. The president certainly ought to demand that Kushner get rid of his financial interests, but it's a hard thing for the president to do because he hasn't gotten rid of his own financial interests. Kushner's lawyer insists he has had no role in the Kushner company since joining the government and that he has followed all ethics advice, including recusing himself when appropriate. Kushner's job as one of the president's most trusted advisors has given him extraordinary access to foreign and business leaders. But according to the Washington Post, several foreign governments have discussed ways to try and manipulate him by taking advantage of his inexperience 
and his business troubles. Well, Jared's done an outstanding job. I think he's been treated very unfairly. He's a high-quality person. It isn't just the Democrats taking an interest in Kushner's complicated finances. The special counsel is investigating as well, and his finances may have something to do with his apparent inability to get a security clearance uh, in the past year. Uh, just this past week, he was downgraded, his access to classified information downgraded from top secret to secret. Cecilia and Dan? Yeah, and David, it has been a really rough week for Jared Kushner. That review of security clearances that you mentioned was prompted by that Rob Porter departure, very controversially. Uh, Chief of Staff John Kelly now has a new explanation for what happened there. That's right. Kelly now says that Porter resigned the day the scandal broke, but that doesn't square with events. Just the day after the scandal broke, here in this room, uh, Press Secretary Sarah Sanders was uh, expressing full confidence in Porter. Bottom line, Kelly says the White House could have handled things better, but he says at no point did he think of resigning. Dan and Cecilia? Yeah, there are a lot of questions about the timeline that he has laid out. David, thank you very much. As we've said, it's a whole new level of turmoil at the White House. Cecilia, you've been there since the jump. Uh, how bad is it? Well, I think the fact that the president is angry right now with what many people, who many people thought was the untouchable Jared Kushner, says a lot. And we're not just talking about Jared Kushner. We are looking at the departure of Hope Hicks, one of his closest aides, just within the past few days, uh, and 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 now potentially more names to come, big names in the president's inner circle. There is a real sense that the knives are out behind the scenes in the White House. There are growing factions, and the reality is, with all of this drama, they are not getting a lot of policy done. Uh, I want to ask more about Jared Kushner. So let's bring in ABC News chief political analyst Matthew Dowd. Matt, good, good morning to you. So as we know, and David and, and Cecilia have laid this out, Jared Kushner is facing questions about conflicts of interest. He's entangled in the Russia investigation. He's just had his security clearance downgraded. How long can he hang on? Well, in any normal White House, which this one isn't, it, he would have been gone a long time ago, long before even these latest allegations had surfaced just because he couldn't even pass his back FBI background check and get security clearance. So obviously he has a special attribute, which is the son-in-law of the president. So I think that allows him some more leeway in this. But as Cecilia just said in her report and her reports over the last few weeks, this White House, the chances of surviving this White House is akin to surviving the Armitage House in Get Out. A lot of people are watching what's happening there, saying it feels very much like uh, watching a reality show in real time with all of these departures and coming and going. So John Kelly now admits, admits these missteps in that Rob Porter scandal. That is far from the only thing going on. How much, Matt, is all of this getting in the way of the president's agenda? Well, I think the president is his own worst enemy, and now he has some staff that seem to be put, putting up more hurdles in this. I think the biggest problem, this adds to a long series of things that's going to make it very hard to get his agenda through. I think the last fundamental thing that he's going to be able to have done was the tax bill that he got through at the end of last year. The primary reason is this is a midterm election year, and now all the politics come to play, and with a president with a job approval rating in the mid-30s, staff trouble at nearly every level in the White House, the chances of getting anything done while the president continues to tweet and get his own way is exceedingly small. Matt, thank you. We appreciate your referencing uh, the movie Get Out, which is a best picture <laughs> contender tomorrow night. Awesome at the Oscars. movie. Awesome movie. Awesome Still haven't movie. seen it. It's great. Well, you're a little busy covering the White House. <laughs> oh, you got to see it, Cecilia. It's, you got to see really it, good. Cecilia. I take all my movie recommendations from Matt Dowd. Thanks, you, Matt. You should. He, the man's a, a maven. All right. <laughs> Matthew, thank you very much. Excellent as always. We really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to move on now to a wild arrest that was caught on camera. This one is downright cinematic. Yeah, police swarming the suspects just as they were allegedly about to attempt an armored truck heist. ABC's Eva Pilgrim is here with more. Hey, Eva, good morning. Good morning. The way this played out looked like something out of an action thriller, a bold attempt to steal millions of dollars squashed just in time. A dramatic interstate takedown in Florida. Police say a violent two-year plot to steal millions from an armored truck foiled just before the heist. A helicopter capturing the moments officers moved in. One suspect crawling on the ground as he surrendered. Another walking backwards. You see in the video, actually, we have cars in front, cars in the back, vehicles on the side, and we just slowly tighten the noose, stop the vehicle, and get them out. Nobody got hurt. Authorities say the group was planning to rob a Loomis armored truck on Tuesday during a large bank run in Port St. Lucie, killing at least two of the guards working. According to court documents, one of the guards on the truck was in on the plan. 
The motivation? Money. The truck expected to be carrying $4 million. Informants are absolutely critical in these cases that are ongoing. In other words, they're in the planning stages where the informant through audio and video can actually capture the crime as it evolves. Investigators say they use the informant's audio and videotapes to stop the group. This morning, all three are in federal custody. And police say if this attempt had been successful, the trio planned to strike again. They already had a second one in the works. Oh, wild yeah. video, Eva. Thank you very much. Speaking of wild, it has been, as we established at the start of the show, a wild weather weekend. Sam, let's get it back to you for uh, what else you're looking at. All right, and good morning again, everyone. It's not just the East Coast storm. We've talked about that. We've got to get you west. We've got another one, big snow. And many people will see this as a uh, survival issue just because we, our snowpack was so low and we're going to make it up practically in this one storm. Uh, so you're looking at the video of just how, I mean, that's gorgeous run on fresh powder, but also the visibility in the background, not great. Two inches of snow an hour in some cases allowed them to pick up 48 inches of snow in just one day. Uh, that's all across the California Sierra. As you can see the snowpack here, so tall you can't even see which run you're picking. That's how much fresh powder is out there. But again, this is good news for the snowpack. We need it for the entire West Coast. But when I see all these watches of morning spread out the western half of the country, a couple things stand out at me. I want to mention Las Vegas comes in with about a 60 mile per hour wind uh, probably during the day today. Look at the uh, winter storm warnings. They're all in the mountains still of California. They could pick up another 18 inches of snow. And when you see what's going on around Rapid City, Minneapolis, that winter storm watch, that's already ahead for tomorrow when this storm makes a move to the middle of the country. So let's watch this. You've got that low spreading all that rain on the coastline pushes all of that inland. So we're going to take the western half of the country over the next couple of days. We're going to see some snow near Minneapolis. Big snow warning could be up to almost six inches of snow. That's the weather around the nation. Here's what you can expect this morning. Hi, meteorologist Alex. Look at it. We're still watching this coastal storm. Nor'easter kick out into the open Atlantic. Winds won't be nearly as bad today, but still gusty at times, up to 40 miles per hour through the morning hours. I think diminishing to the 30s later on this afternoon. Highs today right around 50 degrees. Now tonight will be breezy and cold. Chills in the 20s, 28 to 34 when you wake up tomorrow morning. Highs on Sunday, plenty of sunshine right around 50 degrees. And the story continues in the next half hour because we'll take that storm and make it the next northeaster on the east coast by midweek when we come back. Why do you look so happy when you say that? I'm that's not happy. Problem. I just You're happy. To... Look at you smiling right now. Because he's going to Miami. <laughs> that's right. He's returning. He doesn't have to deal with it as long as we do. All right. Winter. We're changing here. <laughs> We're going to change the subject. Ron, save us, please. Good morning, Ace. <laughs> Hi. And Dan, Adrian, and Sam. Good morning to you. Good morning, everyone. We're going to be in with breaking news out of Michigan where the manhunt for a college sophomore suspected of fatally shooting his parents on the campus of Central Michigan University. That manhunt is over. 19-year-old James Eric Davis, Jr. He is in custody this morning, accused of killing his parents at a dormitory. Uh, the school was on lockdown yesterday as police searched uh, for the shooter. Davis was found near some train tracks that run through campus. And in Las Vegas, the family of a British tourist who died when the sightseeing helicopter that he was in crashed into the Grand Canyon last month. Uh, he has filed, the family has filed the first lawsuit over that incident. The uh, relatives of Jonathan Udall claim that their son could have survived the crash if the helicopter had been equipped with a crash-resistant fuel system. Five people were killed in that crash. Two people survived. Also in Vegas, the families of the 58 people killed in the October 1st mass shooting at a concert there, they'll receive $275,000 uh, each family uh, from the Victims Fund. That was started as a GoFundMe effort. The nonprofit says it will also provide more than $10 million to dozens of the victims injured in that shooting. The CDC is issuing new numbers on the season's deadly flu epidemic, saying the worst of it may finally be over. While well, 17 more children died from the virus this week, the number of people being treated for flu symptoms has actually gone down. High levels of flu activity uh, has been reported in 32 states, down from 39 states the week before. 114 children, though, have already died from the flu this season. In Charlotte, North Carolina, some 2,000 mourners paid their respects to the late Reverend Billy Graham, the president, the first lady, as well as Vice President Pence, and his wife, remembering the man often called America's pastor. Uh, Graham's children vowing to carry on their father's evangelism. And finally, it wasn't quite Casey at the bat, but more like Russell at the bat. Seattle Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson batting for the New York Yankees in spring training. This happened yesterday.